Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm your host, uh, Deacon Jonathan Stewart. Forgot who I am for a moment. That's not my true identity. I actually have a divine being inhabiting this uh, bag of flesh named Jonathan Stewart. <laughs> Joined by my co-host, Jason Memel. Hello, Jason. Hello there. And we are joined once again, returning champion to the pod, only with one month difference. We got a Howard David Ingham. Did I say your name right this time? You did, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to be talking about Atlantis. Uh, this is going to be a really interesting show. Um, Howard wrote some, some really interesting essays about it that I didn't let Jason read before this uh, program so that everything will be a surprise to him. Before we get to that, however, uh, we do need to do our Patreon plug here at the top of the show. Uh, uh, Jason, we uh, I'm trying to do it as fast as possible because I hate it, but I don't hate receiving money. So please give us money. I guess I'm already starting to do the plug. But uh, so we're going to try to do this fast. Uh, uh, I think my rating record's around 27 seconds, 28 seconds. Is that right, Jason? That's and then right I, yes. Just do so it. It's, Just do it. If, You're if, actually if, like using that time now. Just do it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Jason, do you have the uh, do you have the stopwatch ready? I'm ready. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Three. Two, one, go. We can't do the show without your financial support, so you can help us out by going to patreon.com slash Gnostic and donating for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. We usually do more than five or six pieces of media, but that's all we charge for, so it's a real bonus. You get early access to the shows and anything else that we can possibly give you. Just tell us what you want and we'll give it to you. We just don't give any extra context. We don't want to have things behind the paywall. You can also do one-time donations at paypal.com slash Gnostic, and you can also help us out by telling people about the show, uh, sharing it on your social media, sending people to your favorite episode. Uh, ear to mouth still works. Jason, how did I do? I think I hit all the points. 31 seconds. Ah! <laughs> I, you okay. know, I think you actually got it. I think 38 seconds was your best. So this actually oh. is the best. 28 oh. seconds, I think, was an, was an aspirational thing. Oh, okay, okay. Well, we're going to do some research and get back to you folks because I know you're at the edge of the siege wondering if we've made this achievement. <laughs> <laughs> all 10 of you listeners, viewers. <laughs> Oh my god! Well, there uh, we go. Here we go. Okay, well, good show. So, uh, Dave Howard, David Ingham, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, oh, no, okay, seriously, uh, Howard, can you tell us? Uh, uh, we're mostly going to be talking about Atlantis, you know, and what Atlantis means in the modern world, and sort of its history in the public imagination, and its unsavory connections to some unsavory thought over the last two hundred years. Before we get up to the, the modern day, can you tell us a, a bit about the origins of the Atlantis myth? Okay, so um, classical Greece's most famous professional wrestler. Okay, in fact, the only professional wrestler who you would have heard of from classical Greece, um, who was a, who, who gave up, to be fair, gave up wrestling to go into philosophy. And his we don't actually know what his real name was, but his wrestling name was Plato which means the broad guy, the big guy. The, um, I bet you didn't know that. But yeah, I did, Plato, but it's, Plato, it's, it's, it's fascinating like fact. The rock, right? <laughs> it's like the classical Greek equivalent of the rock, only if the rock went into philosophy, which, to be honest, he might know he joined Johnson. But anyway, um, Plato wrote a number of dialogues, philosophical dialogues. We're not going to go into Platonism or any of that. We're not going to talk about Socrates in any great detail. But just... The main point is that he came up with the idea of Atlantis, and it's a story of a utopian kingdom. It went wrong. It incurred the wrath of the gods. It sank beneath the sea, and it appears in the Critias and the Timaeus. And the frustrating and difficult thing about this story is that neither of these are finished. Neither of these are complete today and this, this is an issue because what that means is that um is that we have a rough idea of what player was trying to get across but he didn't expand it because the story's not finished i think i think the criteria actually ends in mid-sentence zeus got up in front of the assembly of the gods and said lacuna and that's kind of important. And so that occasionally over the centuries, it kind of caught people's imagination. Um, so 
people in the Middle Ages used the Atlantis story as a morality tale, um, a fairy story to sort of explain certain points and things. Um, Roger Bacon wrote mm -hmm. about it in, in a piece of one of his utopian texts. Um, and then around the 17th century, a Jesuit monk who is actually a fairly interesting guy for lots of other reasons other than this, but he wrote a book where he talked about Atlantis. He's one of the first people to map Atlantis. And he draws a map of Atlantis in the Atlantic Ocean, which is called the Atlantic Ocean because... Because... Because? Why? I, I, I don't know. I can't figure it out. Finish it because <laughs> it's where Atlantis was supposed to be. Like, <laughs> it's where Plato said Atlantis was. That's why it's called the Atlantic Ocean. And so... Oh, I've got a tough audience this evening. Right. So that's where we get to. And this kind of is the point. You know, Thomas More writes his Utopia. I think Roger Bacon's Utopia is actually called The New Atlantis and that sort of thing. Um, and it's only really in the 19th century that that actually changes and people start taking the Atlantis story as something other than a thought experiment or a morality tale. Right. So people took what's perhaps a, a metaphorical story and decided that it was literal? Yeah, yeah, basically. And um, I mean, I mean, there's not really any evidence that there's an historical Atlantis, really. Um, there's no real kind of, there's no archaeological remains, although later on people will try, did try to try and prove that. And we'll talk about that in a bit. But um, really, it's only in the 19th century that people start looking in retrospect for Atlantis as a thing that may actually have happened. And there's lots of reasons as to why that might have been, hmm. really. Um, so, 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 yeah, so, so when there's a historical, I, 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 there, no one even thought there was a historical Atlantis until the 19th century. Right. Go bear that in mind. No one thought the story was true. No one pretended to think the story was true. Right. Now, this doesn't mean that something necessarily didn't happen because there are parts of history that, History isn't linear, right? It's important to know that. People know more or less about the past, depending on which part of history they're in. The idea that there is this um, progress that goes like constantly forwards is a lie, okay? There, 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 there is no sort of straightforward progress. So there's things that, you know, we, people in the Middle Ages or in the 19th century, didn't know about history that we do. Um, for example, the site of Tel El Amarna in, in Egypt. Um, Heinrich Schliemann found Troy in the late 19th century. A lot of people didn't think that was real. Um, so there's lots of things. That doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that it, just because people didn't think it was real doesn't mean that it's not real. But there's lots of other reasons as to why it might not be real, which we'll get to. Right. Well, we, we we're now up to the 19th century. So uh, you write about, and of course we'll talk about the book in which you write this, or the collection of essays. But you, you mention a, a figure named Ignatius Donnelly. So Indeed. why does he matter for modern and new age ideas about Atlantis? Because he's back in the 1800s. So does, does who was he, and does he play an important role in this this literalization of of this Atlantis myth? Okay, so Ignatius Donnelly is a 19th century American politician. He was actually a fairly progressive um, politician in his way. He believed in suffrage for women. He believed in suffrage for emancipated slaves. He was an abolitionist, all those things. So, but around 18, so the Lieutenant Governor of Minnesota stopped being the Lieutenant Governor of Minnesota because democracy and went into his hobbies. And he had a lot of time in his hands. He was a big fan of Roger Bacon. OK, so we're back to Roger Bacon again, actually. Um, and he's such a big fan of Roger Bacon 
that he actually wrote a book trying to prove that Roger Bacon was the real author of Shakespeare's plays. Mm -hmm. So he's one of the early, early uptakers of that conspiracy theory as well. OK, so he's basically a twofer. Right. We get we get two classic conspiracy theories that go through Ignatius Donnelly. The other one is that while reading about Roger Bacon, reading about Atlantis, he's like. That's really interesting. So there's this continent that's supposed to have been in the Atlantic Ocean. And essentially, not to put it too, too more, in a more complicated way than I need to, Ignatius Donnelly basically thought, so there are pyramids in Egypt. Right. And there are pyramids in South America. What are the chances? And so he begins to prove these things. So the, he writes a book called Atlantis, the Antediluvian Age in around 1880 something. And he writes this book, Atlantis, the Antediluvian Age. And um, 1882, in fact, yeah. And he basically says, um, and I'm going to quote from it, um, because I came prepared this time. This book is an attempt to demonstrate several distinct and novel propositions. And these are, and it gives you 13 propositions. So I'm just going to read a couple of them. But number one, that there once existed in the Atlantic Ocean opposite the mouth of the Mediterranean Sea, a large island which was the remnant of an Atlantic continent known to the ancient world as Atlantis. Mm -hmm. Number seven is that, that the mythology of Egypt and Peru represented the original religion of Atlantis, which was sun worship. Okay. Number eight was that the oldest colony formed by the Atlanteans was probably in Egypt, mm -hmm. whose civilization was a reproduction of the Atlantic Island. And the last one, that a few persons escaped in ships and on rafts and carried to the nations east and west the tidings of the appalling catastrophe, which has survived to our own time in the flood and deluge legends of the different nations of the old and new worlds. So basically he's like, Civilization started in Atlantis when Atlantis sank beneath the sea. People escaped to the Americas and to Egypt. Right. Okay, well, this sounds reasonable. And Howard, again, thanks so much for coming on. I guess that's that. And <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, uh, I do have to say, this is probably the most straight faced uh, I've had Jonathan, <laughs> I've seen Jonathan on the show so far <laughs> in terms of playing with this stuff. So. I just wanted to call that out. <laughs> the straight face is kind of essential with this because otherwise, yeah. I think I think one of the reasons that so few people have actually written about the nuts and bolts of the Atlantis myth is it, it is so hard to keep a straight face. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so sorry, I derailed you there. So, so so Ignatius puts this together. So why why did he think these things, Howard? <laughs> what? Why why pointy, did he? Aren't they? Yeah, they're pointy buildings. They're pyramid shaped. You know, never mind that it's basically the most, the easiest stable construction for a bit for a culture in the Stone Age to build. Yeah. Um, never mind that, you know, people may have forgotten how to build these things. Of course, he, he ascribed to a myth of progress. So basically, right. he's like, how could someone in the ancient world possibly know how to build a pyramid? Right. Unless someone came along and taught them. Um you know, I mean, you look at those people in South America, they're all stupid, you know, and that sort of thing, right? Um, it's huge. Blockbuster. Massive publishing success. Huh. So much so that Donnelly followed it up with a second book with more stuff on the same subject called Ragnarok, The Age of Fire and Gravel. Which, to be honest, sounds like one of the best metal albums of all time no yeah. kidding <laughs> it's so metal and it's about catastrophe myths and things like that and he, a lot of people looked at donnelly's work and thought there's probably something in this you gotta bear in mind at roughly the same time donnelly's doing this heinrich schliemann goes to turkey with nothing but a copy of the iliad and a lot of frankly over the top self belief and mm -hmm. somehow manages to luck out and find the site of Troy. Yeah. Right. So, you know, the famous gold mask from Troy. 
And, and Schliemann's favorite, famous words as he lifts the mask off the mummified corpse that it's on and says, I have gazed upon the face of Agamemnon. So people actually thought you could do this, do this with ancient Greek mythology. People were mm. basically not ready for it. OK, so people started taking it seriously. Also, you've got to bear in mind that the theory of continental drift was not widely accepted by science until after World War II. Hmm. I don't know if you knew that. Right? No. No, the theory of continental drift was invented by a man named Alfred Wegener in the 1930s. And hmm. he wasn't generally taken seriously for quite a while until people started going, you know what, actually, this does make sense. Um, <laughs> people thought, people knew full well that the continents of the world weren't exactly the same shape once upon a time. But in the Victorian era, science generally was of the opinion that the mantle underneath the Earth's crust, the sort of like larvary, liquidy bit, was basically kind of like bubble wrap <laughs> or, or, or like a, a whoopee cushion. <laughs> and that if you sort of push down on one bit, another bit would pop up. And what this meant was that they generally believed that over the course of history, it was natural for some land to sink below the sea. And when some land sunk below the sea, other land arose, which is why, for instance, people were finding fossils in the middle of landlocked areas of England. Hmm. So like Oxford was what Oxford 65 million years ago was under the sea. Right. OK, but there's other reasons for that, obviously. But they thought obviously they didn't realize that the world was 65 for four billion years old. Right. Let alone six. You know, they didn't think it was 65 million years old. So the idea that, you know, you find, you know, you find the skeleton of a fish in the middle of Oxfordshire. And you're Victorian and you think that land goes up and down. You think that at some point in the last 3000 years, Oxford had sunk below the sea and then had risen up. Right. Does that make sense? It does. And, and I can also have a little bit more, you know, perhaps a sympathy for, for some of these uh, out there thinkers uh, mm -hmm. in the yeah. 1800s, early the uh, 1900s, if this is the, the science of the day, right? They're actually applying the science that they have. So uh, it, it yes. does make a lot more sense. Yeah. And, and um, this, this is kind of important, actually. You've got to bear in mind that these ideas weren't originally stupid ideas. Right. They were wrong uh, ideas. <laughs> But <laughs> they're bad ideas. <laughs> but they're bad ideas. But they're yeah. ideas based upon logic, based upon what people knew at the time. Mm. And Ignatius Donnelly wasn't a bad guy. You know, he was a man of his period. And, you know, obviously the man of his age argument, you know, that's something you have to be very careful with. Um, but he's a man of his periods. And as a man of his period, he had the scientific background of a Victorian and the assumptions of a Victorian in terms of science and stuff. So while he makes some leaps and it's fair to say that his Atlantis books were hugely, hugely popular and influential and then they weren't. Okay. Mm -hmm. They were taken seriously enough for people to go, you know, you know, this makes sense. And then people investigated it and treated it seriously as science. And did what happens when you find some science that turns out not to be good science after all? You find a new science. Okay, so this, this, this is kind of important because roughly the same time, there's also in the Pacific a mystery. Okay, so um, Paul Sclater, who is a contemporary and sometime frenemy of Charles Darwin, um, notices that there are lemurs mm -hmm. in Madagascar. And you, you know what a lemur is, right, guys? Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's cuddly. It's got big round eyes. It's very cute. And, and it bites you and gives you rabies if you get too close. <laughs> and these little monkeys, they're in Madagascar, but they're also in the recent fossil record in Sri Lanka. And you've got, also got to bear in mind that people didn't think the world was four billion years old just yet. You know, you know, Darwin was working on millions of years, right? But 
we're talking five million years rather than 65 or whatever, right? Um, they find fossils of lemurs in Sri Lanka, which is the other side of the Indian Ocean, okay? And Sclater goes, the only way that that could make sense is if there was once a land bridge there. And he comes up with the idea and he goes, I shall call it Lemuria. And two somewhat more famous biologists of the era, Ernst Haeckel and Alfred Russell Wallace, again, contemporaries of Darwin. Wallace was the other person who came up with the theory of the special theory of evolution on his own. Mm -hmm. at roughly the same time that Darwin did. Yeah. And people forget that, right? Because what Darwin managed to do before Alfred Russell Wallace was publish. Publish or be damned. He, Wallace kicked his heels on publishing. That's why we call it Darwinism rather than Wallaceism, which, to be honest, <laughs> works better. So I think we dodged a bullet there, philosophically speaking. Anyway, um, so... Wallace and Heckel basically both independently go, you know what? We still haven't found the missing link yet. And we know that the human race arose somewhere in that area. And obviously this is, this is of course, in the era when they were still looking for a missing link rather than common ancestors. You know, if you know what I mean, right? It's sort of mm -hmm. rather than like one family tree rather than like lots of branches and more complicated and messy evolution you know because evolution has evolved as 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 as, <laughs> as it has been thought of um and they were like you know what basically human civilization could have arisen on in Lemur lemuria it's quite possible you know because there's like super ancient civilizations in both sides of that indian ocean it's quite possible that human the human race and the missing link might be found under the sea in the Indian Ocean on the site of Lemuria. Right, right. So we've talked about uh, Blavatsky and theosophy on the show in a few different contexts before. Uh, what did Blavatsky and theosophy have to do with Atlantis? Well, Madame Blavatsky, um, and obviously we all know about Madame Blavatsky, obviously, the eyes. <laughs> Yeah, you, you didn't want to get judged by the eyes of Madame Blavatsky. Um, she was very much a believer in evolution. And I don't know if you've talked about Blavatsky's idea of cosmic memory and root races before. You know, it, it hasn't come up. And when we've talked to people connected to theosophy, they strangely did not want to bring it up. So we just uh, just left that off the question sheet. How you know, why, why, Howard? Yeah. Why, why is there anything well, with okay, that? Well, OK, so people don't talk about this because on the one hand, um, theosophists generally consider this the embarrassing bit that they feel they've grown out of. And on the other hand, people who aren't into theosophy basically go, well, that's just bollocks, isn't it? So the issue is that Blavatsky believed that there would be seven rounds, each with seven root races of seven sub races, which would be on the seven planets of the solar system. Um, since our solar system has in fact turned out to have a variable number of planets, she's already wrong. But let's just go there. I mean, and one of those planets would be the sun? No, no, we start no. with um, start oh, okay, Mercury. Right. Mercury. Start with Mercury, move outwards. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and, and, uh, you know, it's going to end with Uranus because obviously it will disappear up Uranus. <laughs> but you can edit that out if you want. That's kind of one of the worst jokes I'm, I've ever said. I, I I'm, I'm going to copy and paste it throughout the interview. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So seven root races and seven sub races exist on Mercury. Civilizations rise and fall. Eventually, humanity spirits move on to Venus. And then the third round to Earth. They start in Hyperborea, the first root race, the Polarians, and the Hyperboreans are the first and second root races, which are bodiless creatures, originally gaseous, which later become sort of amorphous, blobby things. And then in Lemuria, they arise into something vaguely approaching the shape of a man. 
and then and, and incidentally my lifelong um interest in atlantis and lemuria basically stems to seeing a picture an artist's impression of a lemurian holding a dinosaur on a lead mm. in um, a book about atlantis that my dad had mm. um from the 1970s that's where it all comes from because when you're when you know when you when you're 11 years old you see a dinosaur a, a giant with a dinosaur on a lead it's the coolest thing in the world yeah anyway so the lemurians originally they had three eyes a third one on the back of their head which mm -hmm. would later become the human pineal gland it's the eye through which they could see into the akashic records and i'll say have you done the akashic record we haven't so oh go god off. okay so all of this comes from reading the akashic record which right. is the library of the spiritual history of mankind which exists in the ether mm. it exists around us and among us it's the psychic library of everything um big readers of the akashic record included blavatsky blavatsky's successors Leadbeater and Bessant, and also rudolf steiner who we're going to get to up as well in a minute um eventually the lemurians oh these races sort of like rise and fall but they overlap as well so they stick around for a while okay so the lemurians basically are superseded by the more intelligent people of atlantis who have seven root races okay. these root races start becoming called things like the original semites and the mongolians and things that suddenly start they start with like basically nonsense names like the Romoa Howls, the Romo Howl, the, the Mo, Moa Ro, whatever they're called, right? It's unpronounceable. <laughs> I've never heard anybody actually tell me how to pronounce Romo, whatever the hell that is. Um, to Lavatlis. And then, you know, you get the terrain, the first Turanians, the, fir the original Semites, the Mongolians, and you start going, okay, it starts sounding like something, you know. And then there's the fifth root race. And this is where it starts getting a bit hairy. Um, the fifth root race, who are the currently extant superior race, according to Blavatsky, are in of the five or six sub races that currently exist, according to Blavatsky, called the Aryans. Mm -hmm. And then if you look mm -hmm. back... I thought, thought we might be going there. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, keep going. I think people at home were, were starting to be like, I bet. I bet he's not going to say Black Africans. Uh, no, no, they're the Lemurians. Right. And, and the Asians are the Atlanteans. Oh, um, okay. You've also got to bear in mind yeah. that a lot of post-Darwinians, so although Darwin sidestepped this as far as I know, a lot of people taught in schools and stuff that the human race basically had three subspecies right um black people asian people and white people um south asian people people of the indian subcontinent are um count as white in that kind of um schema which is interesting mm. um okay so yeah so you've got this thing where like the third root race and the fourth root race are still around and they're they're not as cool as the fifth root race and and, and it's like man of Blavatsky's like the human race developed five million years ago in hyperborea and all these sorts of things and you know the cosmic masters tell her this and you know you gotta bear in mind that Blavatsky is either the foundation of the new age movement and the bottleneck through which all new age thought goes or the greatest white magician of all time, or a complete charlatan, or at some points in her life, all three. Yeah. Simultaneously. Um, totally caught faking phenomena on numerous occasions, somehow managed to completely brave her way through. White knuckle it and change no one's mind. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating woman, racist as hell. Right. Okay. And this is where it starts going. So you move on. Um, a big follower of Blavatsky, who well, there's loads of stuff, and we could be here all night. And I, what I will say is that there is actually a lengthy talk on my Patreon 
which you can find. You can you can access it for just just a single dollar. Um, and my a talk called the scam from Atlantis, which gives this in much more length. But essentially, one of the big followers and the big important followers is Rudolf Steiner, mm-hmm. um, who on the one hand invented Waldorf schools mm-hmm. and organic farming as a thing rather than just farming before we had chemicals mm-hmm. um and stein is an interesting guy who you've probably had entire episodes on by now and if you haven't you probably will um but steiner wrote books about atlantis he had this fantastic my favorite one is where he talks about atlantean airships and says that they're powered by an acorn because <laughs> they're powered by the potential energy in the acorn from which you can get an entire tree wow yeah, so that's an uh, acorn in the engine, and all the potential life energy of that acorn powers the airship. The the vril powers the airship. We we have done a show on Steiner, and I'm sure we'll be doing more. But you know, I really appreciated it in your book. You know, if you're not a believer or a Steinerite or or what mm-hmm. have you, that that you really uh, appreciate. Um, you know, I don't want to insult anybody who is a follower of, of Steiner uh, uh, watching or listening to the show, but it, uh, let, let's say his creativity, his insight, um, <laughs> his, uh, his poetic abilities. There, that's 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 a nice political way of, of putting it um, uh, that, that I think won't uh, uh, won't piss off anybody. Before we, we delve into Steiner, if we can slow down just for a second, Howard, just to check in with, uh, with Jason. Jason, do you have any questions that I haven't put on the sheet, anything rolling around your mind or clarifications or connections or anything at all? Yeah. So, well, like the, uh, it's, <laughs> there's actually been questions I've been thinking about asking, but then uh, Howard will get to the, like, will answer the question bef- just before I ask it. Um, but one of the things that, um, that I kind of want to go back to is like how, uh, you know, things like Ignatius Donnelly, Blavatsky, this, it, it's got me thinking a lot about uh, the, the requirement for truth in um, myth, in religion, in etc. Uh, and how that, how that can kind of cause something like Atlantis to happen as, a, as an experience in that sense that like, um, you know, Plato starts with what's probably a parable, you know, um, in a in a mode that probably a lot of his listeners are accepting as a parable, but that uh, over time and through like things like this, like lens of history in which everything Plato says must be true or serious or etc. That like uh, that this it it turns into this sort of palimpsest that we can attach anything to. Um, so I, maybe I guess my question. Because uh, I also want to connect this to Gnosticism. Like, why why are we talking about this on Talknosis? Is uh, what uh, maybe can you could you like characterize the impulse to make Atlantis the the proof or the justification for the various things that you want to do, like pyramids or like racial superiority or what have you? Well, first thing is it's there. You know, you you've got this. Um... You know, there's a big gap between Africa and America. And there's pointy buildings on both sides. And it's easier to assume that something came from this big gap that's there. Remembering that you didn't actually have any idea what might close that 250 years ago. Than to believe that brown people might have built this stuff on their own back. Or that we might have forgotten how they were built. Um... I think also do know that this coincides roughly with the same period of history where Christians are basically start trying to prove that the world was created in 4004 BC, according to Bishop Usher, um, by looking at fossils and flood records and all that answers in Genesis nonsense. And this is about the same time it happens. This is about the time that the Christian science movement starts trying to make Christian science. It's about the time that people start finding facts more important than truth. And perhaps Mm. start conflating or, or conflating the two, perhaps. Because I think that the ancients understood that facts and truth weren't necessarily the same thing. And that a thing can be true without factually happening. You read um, ancient 
philosophy, ancient historians like um, Herodotus or Livy, and they will tell you multiple versions of historical events. And basically goes and basically will go, I like this one better because it feels more right and it tells us more about the human condition. Um, not in so many words, but that's the kind of thing that you get happening. And I think that people wanted to explain things. You've got Darwin, whose theories did pose a threat. But also, you've got to bear in mind that Darwin's theories pose a threat on numerous grounds, and it's messy. So, for example, you, you've heard of the John Scopes monkey trial of about 1920. I think it's 1920. Um, there's there's um, 1925. You know, John Scopes was a teacher who was is famously supposed to have been taken to court for teaching evolution in schools. Mm -hmm. um, he was teaching evolution as race science. And the grounds on which he was taken to court for teaching evolution by William Jennings, William Jennings Bryan, who was a presidential candidate, I believe, um, in a few years before that. Um, Bryan basically took him to court, not because it was a violation of biblical truth, but it was a violation of the biblical truth that God created men in his image. Hmm. And that black people might not be as evolved as you know it was a violation of the idea that all people were people and equal right so they left God, us out of it they left us out of inherit the wind <laughs> they, they left this bit out of inherit the wind yeah where where poor old william jennings bryan is shown as like a benighted bigot and scopes is seen as a, as a champion of science and in fact no no he was hella racist and well, you know, people forget this. People forget that this is not neat. People forget. I, I, I own a copy of an encyclopedia from a reputable British publisher from about 1928, which has in its section on race a table showing the differences between the three subspecies of humans. This was taught in school. It's only after the Second World War that these ideas generally became to be removed from scientific and its academic discourse. And the sad thing is, is that the only reason that they were removed was because people would suddenly realize what would happen if you took these things seriously. So for example, um, Heinrich Himmler was a big fan of Blavatsky and not so much of Steiner, interestingly. Um, although Waldorf schools have also had problems in terms of race as well, which is sad because I've got a lot of time for Waldorf schools, but um, the, the ideas of reincarnation that they have come through based around human evolution, based upon Blavatsky's idea of root races. And that can get you into sticky ground very quickly. Um, but Himmler sent an expedition to Tibet led by a man named Ernst Schaefer to, in 1938 to find the root of the Aryan race. And also get into the holy Tibetan city of Lhasa before the British did, because it would piss off the British. But they're there. There's a group of SS men in Tibet in 1938 wandering around the Himalayas, measuring people's heads with calipers. Because Atlantis. Right. You know, I never made that connection before, but it's so interesting that, that during the same age, when people are taking the Garden of Eden story and trying to make it literal, it's the same time that they're taking the metaphorical story of Atlantis and making it literal. That, that real yeah. shift into... Um, a scientific worldview without science in a way, right? There is this shift in human consciousness in the West. Um, and that that's really interesting. That's an interesting reflection and a connection I, I never made before. Because for people watching and listening, like Howard was saying, not to overly valorize ancient people um, or to, you know, 
do my own you know mini Atlantis by saying we got to return you know return to the past. Um, but uh, they 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 were much more sophisticated than many modern people uh, believe. And you know uh, Jason and I within our spiritual community, um, uh, our our. Um, uh, uh, our lodge master, our teacher, uh, often points out that you know Origen in the fourth century wrote that, that the Bible could be, it sh can and should uh, should be interpreted in three ways: literal, uh, ethical, and uh, uh, in a mythical sense. And actually, the mythical yeah. sense is the truest sense. And uh, I'm paraphrasing Origen. I think I've said this on the show before, but he says something like, "Can you believe that there's dummies out there that think the Garden of Eden story is true? Like it actually literally." happen can you yeah. believe such a thing and this was uh, 1700 years ago uh, he's a complex guy because then on the other hand in order to enforce his own vow of chastity he cut his own balls off so yes. you know very literal reading there yeah they yeah. were all reading there so i think but yeah origin says can you not believe can you believe that there are people who actually think these idiots yeah um i mean that's exactly it isn't it it's it's how this thing goes i mean so well and, and this is the, the, I, I wanted to, to jump in here too because I think this is what I found, what I keep finding so fascinating about about it is that it's this, um, uh, it's got this like for me the myth of it has this interesting pseudo or or a vague connection to history that allows it to be, um, I don't know how to put this like true enough or possibly true enough or enough of a mystery or what have you that. Uh, that it kind of becomes a a um, uh, like a, a place to hang your proof, if that makes sense. A place to hang your your truth claims, um, because like because Plato, you know, uh, versus it being like I had this weird vision, or I just don't like people of a different color, and so I've decided to justify this personally. Like it's it's this idea that I uh, being able to point to something else as a truth claim. And going back to what John was saying was that also that notion of like. Uh, that that there was uh, something I've been finding interesting is this idea that it that there was a certain point in spiritual and esoteric practice uh, where where truth became important or or where sort of like where there had to be a universal truth. It wasn't enough for you to be following a particular thing, but no, this has to be completely and totally true for absolutely everybody, and therefore you know. Uh, all kinds of bad things happen from there, which I think. Yeah, I mean, your unverifiable personal gnosis yeah. suddenly becomes verifiable when you've got like some got a, got a, a respectable historical text to hang it on. Yeah. Um, basically. And, yeah, and and the other, and I sorry to, I, I feel like I might be shanghaiing the conversation a bit, but I do want to, no, I want to attach it to. To, I wanted to attach it to Gnosticism here because I think there is sort of the like why is Talknosis talking about this? Maybe some of our guests can already intuit that, but I, I feel like it's maybe worth saying out loud that like um, this this capacity to have a a myth that can be both uh, liberating but also um, oppressing uh, is is I think something that can probably speak a lot to people who are who are finding themselves really connected to a Gnostic uh, uh, worldview. You know, this idea of uh, both both that, that there's a layer of spirituality that's like, no, we're actually keeping you down. We're, we're trying to keep you from getting anywhere special. And then, but also conversely, oh, there's this other layer by, by which liberation happens. I think like, it, what's interesting to me is that like Atlantis is both depending on who you're talking to, <laughs> you know, or what period you're reading from. Yeah, it's it's true. Atlantis could be a utopia. I mean, for Thomas More, Roger Bacon, it was a liberating utopian idea. Um, for Madame Blavatsky, it was a way to... It's actually a way to allow her to repackage Hinduism for a sceptical Western audience and to repackage Hinduism for white people. And we're not going to go... Let's not go too far into that because you've done Blavatsky, right? But Bavatsky was all about repackaging Hinduism for white people a lot, a lot of the way. A lot of it is like taking, shoehorning Hindu ideas into classical thinking, classical Western thinking and stuff like that. So things like Isis Unveiled and the Secret Doctrine are largely plagiarized. A lot of them, you know, she takes the Rig Veda and, and, and the Sama Veda and all the other Vedas and she kind of um, 
mashes them all together and turns them into sort of like a cyborg, evil Vader, <laughs> a kind of Darth Vader, and mm. <laughs> kind of yeah, that's not funny. I know, but anyway, <laughs> no, 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 I enjoyed it. <laughs> but, but yeah, um, she does that, and it, it's, it's influential. I think it's the point. So even the thing is, science. You gotta bear in mind that a lot of the people who came up with this idea and clung on to it are very establishment, very traditional. You know, Rudolf Steiner is was a really inspirational and interesting. I mean, his his books were burned by the Nazis. He was very racist, but he's the wrong sort of racist. <laughs> he, he was a patronizing racist rather than an exterminationist racist. And I think, you know, the Nazi, he wasn't racist enough for the Nazis, basically. And that's the sort of thing you've got to bear in mind. Um, Stein is interesting. You've got, you've got people like Edgar Cayce, um, the American, it was an American guy who basically did thousands of post-hypnotic regressions for clients. And many of those were set in Atlantis. And he has his own version of Atlantis. And it's interesting, Edgar Cayce's version it's very much a kind of like diesel age Atlantis. Atlantis has televisions and nuclear bombs in Casey's version. In um, but while back in like you know the first part of the 20th century, um, you've got a guy called William Scott Elliot, um, maybe a little before that, who um, with the help of Blavatsky's immediate successor, Charles Webster Ledbetter, again someone who probably deserves his own um, own episode because he's like an incredibly problematic figure. He, um, Ledbetter and Scott Elliott, write a steampunk, steam age Atlantis with airships and things. These we, we create Atlantis in our own image, just like a lot of these things. A lot of, I think, a lot of religious and spiritual ideas, particularly Atlantis, which you know, a lot of Atlantis writing, particularly from the last 70 or 80 years has been channeled. And the idea of the Akashic record, the, the sort of like cosmic memory, as, as Rudolf Steiner called it, that surrounds us all, and that you could draw from it as if it's like a library and read it like it's a book, um, is, you know, it's spiritual. It, it encourages people to be spiritual. So for example, um, here's a famous reader of the Akashic record, David Icke, who, has also written at length in his endless, endless books on Atlantis. And I've, you know, I've done talk, I'm, I'm working on a book about David Icke at the moment. Um, and where David, Icke, where, where, where David Icke comes from and how you get to David Icke. Um, because again, David Icke doesn't come from nowhere. Specifically, he comes from the BBC sports department. But the fact is, these things come from somewhere they and it's important to see this see when you get to modern people modern writers who are looking at the atlantis stuff like graham hancock for instance writer of fingerprints of the gods and he himself is drawing from the same evidence set as the earlier writer irish von daniken and of course, his take on Atlantis in the 1960s and 70s is, of course, a sci-fi Atlantis, where God was a spaceman. Madame Blavatsky said that human spirits descended from other planets spiritually. Um, Erich von Däniken gives us actual literal spaceships. Landing paths in Peru. The Perry Race map, which is supposedly based on a on, uh, on a satellite survey even though it was made in 1513 um and supposed to show the the um the the, the coastline of antarctica in a detailed way and um spoilers it wasn't and it doesn't but all of these things are basically given a history and people develop them and work on them in their own way and that's where they get and that, that i mean that's why it was important if you're talking about gnosis on your podcast if you're talking about 
revelation. Um, Atlantis is important. It's important as a cautionary tale. But the way in which treat, people have treated Atlantis is a cautionary tale. Because it's a cautionary tale of the intersection between revelation and our effect on the world, which may not be as positive as we might want it to be. It's easy to be racist if you sincerely believe that a voice from heaven has told you that black people are descended from the bestial people of Lemuria. Because that's God telling you that, or God, or however you conceive him, as the Alcoholics Anonymous people say. The, it's, it's the spiritual realm. And we find it harder to think that our revelations might be lying to us. Uh, Howard, uh, we've uh, uh, diverted back to some of these pivotal figures in the 20th century. So, so we did. You, you did talk about. Uh, we did end up with with our friend Steiner and uh, Steinerites and Theosophists who are watching and listening. We have lots of programming you would like, and don't cancel your Patreon. Uh, somebody <laughs> that I always find <laughs> very interesting is uh, Shaver, the Shaver Mystery. We have oh, had a chance to, to to bring him up on the show before, um, and and oh, I find fine. that. Yeah, you know, I find that his mythology is is, is surprisingly um, uh, influential, and it pops up in, uh, in in a variety of different places. Uh, and did, was his take on Atlantis influential? Like, did it make a uh, did, did it make an impact uh, on the New Age? Did it make an impact on people interested in Atlantis, or is it just sort of confined to his own sort of uh, writings and, and mythology? Yes, it was influential. Next question. Um, no, all right, yeah, no, um, of course, Shaver's take on Atlantis appears in I, I Remember Lemuria, which is the first story in which the Darrows and the Shaver mystery appears. It's in uh, Amazing Stories in the 1940 something, uh, my memory today, the 1948 or 1949, it appears in Amazing Stories. And what was interesting is that the guy who ran amazing stories started saying well this is fiction or is it maybe you should tell us what you feel about it and what's interesting is that shaver's obvious story about how there is a civilization beneath the ground that's sending evil thoughts into his head with machines mm -hmm. um is a well-known delusion yes in the realms of psychiatry that goes back was first in fact it was first catalogued before psychiatry existed right people recognized this delusion in the 19th century it predates freud okay um the guy who ran amazing stories realized he was onto something got shaver to write more of these stories but got people to write in and talk about it um and of course it's a huge influence on things because his stuff goes to other planets so eric von daniken is basically drawing from the same mythological well eric von daniken of course chariots of the gods from the same mythological well as shaver it enters pop culture as well so i think in our chat beforehand you mentioned that jack kirby um drew on shaver for the eternals um which I, is a comic book I'm not familiar with, but I've never read that one, but or seen the movie actually. But there's that. You can go more recently to Jordan Peele's 2019 film Us, is basically a film about Darrow's. Um, but it's done. It's, it's a good film about Darrow's because it uses the Darrow's as a jumping point to make points about who we are as a society, and points about race and a memory. An identity and self. Um, it's a fantastic movie. Um, I think it was my favourite movie of that year. Um, so, yeah. 
hugely influential, hugely popular. Um, the ship that launched a thousand paranoid delusions. Let us be frank. But it drew upon the fears of its age. And essentially, it's a version of Atlantis that fits the late 40s and early 50s, just as um, Casey's fit the time, the end of the Second World War. Scott Elliott's fit the 1910s, 1920s. Blavatsky's fit the late 19th century. You know, we each can. What's interesting about each conception of Atlantis is that it fits our conception of what a utopian society should look like. Yeah. And although Shavers is also quite entertaining because it's really, really horny as well. Yeah. Sh Shaver Shavers got some fetishes. Yeah. going on and then they they express themselves in his writing they they, they, they they certainly do same thing with his visual artwork too his rock books which i highly recommend looking up so i just need to i can't quite shoehorn it into narcissism because we, we actually did talk about shaver for a little while on, on a show that was um, sort of a Jungian take on ufos because the shaver mystery is also quite influential on, on later ufo mythology so Indeed. uh so, and someday, if, if I can find some sort of excuse to tie it into Gnosticism, we'll, we'll go even deeper because, you know, obviously there, there's some moral issues because of the way that I, he was frankly exploited, I, I think, it engaging was. with his work. But and his story is really tragic, isn't it? It's about it bereavement, is. it's about psychological breaks, it's about some terrible bad luck. Yeah, but it is so intriguing his, in his his writing and his mythology is so intriguing. But that's, uh, I'm trying to shoehorn it in right now. But I understand, Jason, you have a question. That's on the sheet, just for you. You're right. Uh, I do have a question. Um, the uh, so this is a question that I I only know to ask because uh, Jonathan is very interested in the answer to this. Um, but uh, it says space Barbie. Oh, this is a good space Barbie. All right. So um, <laughs> <clears throat> around ten years ago, eight, no, about seven or eight years ago. Um, people noticed a Ukrainian model called Valeria Lukianova, who was a breatharian. She believed that only by breathing, drinking water and eating vitamins, you could survive. She was very thin, but she had had various um, surgical procedures, although she denied that she had quite as many done as she actually clearly had. Um, she became exactly like a Barbie doll. And a lot of people went, oh, wow, that's amazing. However, what they missed was also the fact that she also believed that she was the reincarnation of a priestess from Lemuria called Amatu. A transgender priest from Lemuria called Amatu, who and, and, and actually ran a cult of people who were into past life, um, past life regressions to Lemuria and set herself up in her early 20s as a spiritual teacher because she believed that she was this priest from the Mura called Amachu and um, eventually moved to South America and hung around around pyramids and stuff. There's photos of her, there's photos of her with Alejandro Hodorowsky, um, unsurprisingly. Um, the main, also, the main things to know about Space Barbie, which make her less fun, are that she's antinatalist and um, white supremacist, um, being Ukrainian, uh, you, you white supremacists, white supremacists are big in Ukraine. Um, and so she, a few years ago, when she moved to South America to set up a yoga school there or whatever it was, she was doing lots of times, lots of moments where she was being shot in front of Machu Picchu and stuff like that. So, you know, this again, and Atlantis is part of this. Currently, I looked her up today to see what she was up to now, and she's actually now doing spiritual transhumanism um, and, and, and running spiritual courses online in transhumanism and still looking like a Barbie doll. That's Space Barbie. Well, this is a good transition to our, our new announcement that I'm leaving Gnosticism and joining the Space Barbie cult. And this is now a Space Barbie uh, podcast. So tune in for our next episode with our guest, Space Barbie. Uh, all jokes oh, no, no. aside, we are getting into wrap-up time. Uh, 
We are. Uh, uh, although I could go all night, you could go all night. It's literally night where you are. Uh, but before, before I have some final questions that. there. But, but Jason, do you, do you have anything? No, I think uh, uh, I just want to highlight what you mentioned there um, regarding how uh, the myth of it can be, can like that it's supposed to be a utopia, but what that utopia is changes depending on who is uh, looking at it. I think, um, I think, I just, I think, feel like there's a very valuable thing to think about whenever, uh, whenever you're encountering Atlantis, like. Um, you know, the the question if, if someone is saying like, oh, I've got this new book about Atlantis, the, your next question would be like, great, what does your utopia look like? And do I want to hear about it? <laughs> you know, um, I yeah. just think that's an interesting way to approach it. Um, yeah. Howard, I, I guess my final question is, in your opinion, when Atlantis pops up in modern day spirituality as part of a spiritual system or being brought up by a spiritual teacher, should we always be scared that there's racism lurking around it? Or is, is that sort of an overreaction? What do, you, what do you think? I think that every religious and spiritual system has at least one baked in problem. Yeah. That doesn't mean that you can't override the problem. Okay, so the New Age and the Atlantean stuff, right? Race is baked in in a lot of the earliest writings because Blavatsky and that, right? That doesn't mean that all New Ages are necessarily racist, although the ones who stormed the capital in the USA on the 6th of January most probably were. Um, the, I think that it's how it's used. I think that the more people treat the Atlantis myth as being literally true, the more likely you are to get to a vanishing point of being hella racist. Okay. And I think that's true of anything. I think the more likely you are, for example, to think the Guardian of Eden was literally true, um, the more dangerous your Christianity is likely to be. I think that if you start trying to treat things that are have a moral point and are moral thought experiments and moral stories as being just factual historical narratives with no weight beyond actually happening and then make that an article of faith then it gets dangerous and with atlantis then it gets racist okay but that doesn't mean that you can't look at the atlantis story and use it as a point of meditation maybe as, as I did a few years ago, write a revisionist Atlantis, if you want to. You know, um, I wrote a series of fictions about a revisionist Atlantis and wrote, turned them into a role-playing game, which you can still find on Drive Through RPG, and it's um, Pay What You Want. Um, hmm. It's called Chariot, and you can find it, yeah, on drivethroughrpg.com. Um, but this... You know, and I use that as a sort of magical working, but I turn it into a role playing game because why not? Um, so, yeah, yeah, if people treat it as a fact, sharp and take a breath through the teeth. But you have to see how people treat these things. You have to see how people want these things. You know, the Bible may be massively homophobic and misogynist, but that doesn't mean that there aren't feminist and trans and gay Christians who have grappled with these things. I think an honest grappling with the problems that come from these stories allow us to redeem these stories and find value in them. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's the perfect ending uh, uh, place. Uh, Howard, can you tell people about uh, where they can find you online, about your project, uh, all, all those good plugs? Okay, so I'm still the host, co-host of um, the Nigel Neal podcast, Burcast, burcast.room207press.com. Um, my blog, um, which is going to be updated in the next week or so, because it hasn't been updated for a while, is at room207press.com. And you can also access some talks on that I've done, as well as like other writings that aren't publicly available on my Patreon, because I've got a Patreon too, patreon.com <laughs> slash Howard David Ingham. And everything you want to know about that, um, John said about his podcast beforehand. Um, so... <laughs> 
that's that's really re really it. Um, well, the, the name of your book with the um, uh, uh, with oh, the essays the on Atlantis. miracles. Yes. Notes on the collapse of history. Essays on the collapse of history, which is about five years old, and some parts of it are out of date. Um, there is, for example, one bit which sort of goes, "Ha, Boris Johnson, he's never going to be prime minister." Um, so I'm <laughs> not exactly good at calling everything, but yeah, um, that's that's. Um, I would love it if you if you found that it's on Kindle Unlimited. If you have that, so you can have a look at it and see if you want to buy it. But you can have a look at it for free if you've got Kindle Unlimited. So that's good. Um, yeah. Remember, so, that's digital. You can go back and edit it and say, you know what, Boris Johnson, I, I, he may not be my guy, but he's definitely going to win. And <laughs> sign out for yeah, you know, well, twenty fifteen. To be aware of your mistakes, isn't it? Yeah. There's also uh, uh, you were wrong. You can always also just be, add a footnote, like edit. I look back I at this can. and wince. Yes, I'm usually <laughs> sarcastic and self-deprecating. Yeah. So, yes, and on my Patreon, there are talks about Atlantis. There are talks about folk horror, which is what I did last time. There is a talk about how you get a David Icke. There is a talk about a fascinating um, consp fascinating um, controversy about a psychic who got fought, caught faking in the 1970s. As well as lots of writing and lots of and some audio readings of things that I've written, um, ghost stories, all sorts of stuff there at my Patreon. And um, I'd love to see you there. And it's only one dollar to subscribe. Amazing. I'll also put those uh, links in the show notes for those listening to this as a podcast. Uh, I will quickly do my plug, which is mylandmeditation.substack.com. Uh, one of my day jobs when I'm not writing marketing copy is teaching mindfulness-based stress reduction and secular modern psychology-based meditation. So to keep myself in practice and to give back and to not always take money for it, uh, free meditation, mylandmeditation.substack.com. Sunday mornings, 11 a.m. Montreal time, which is Eastern Standard Time, New York time. And uh, yeah, you can attend online. Uh, we've got a great group of people that come out. Uh, feel free to check that out anytime. Uh, Jason, any plugs? Uh, nothing major. I think uh, most of the time uh, trying to plug the theater company that I run uh, is difficult in a podcast that's probably heard all over the world. So uh, yeah, jasonmemmel.com, uh, just my name, and then sagetheater.com if you happen to live in Calgary and want to see some cool theater. Um, and yeah, other than that, uh, that's about it for me. Fantastic. Okay, well, well again, thanks so much, uh, Howard, and hopefully you can come back uh, on my new podcast, uh, Talk Space Barbie. <laughs> Talk Space Always Barbie. a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.